Today on Beyond History, Knoxville's Black Experience. That's the thing about UT. When they decided that they would admit uh, African-American students, they did it without any fanfare. They did it in a very civilized way. The story of the University of Tennessee's first African-American graduate. That's the telling story for me from Cal Johnson, that I was a slave, but yet look at what I achieved. Look at what I contributed to my community. From slavery to the Speedway, how Knoxville's first black millionaire made his riches. Plus, how the first black Miss Tennessee is using her platform for autism awareness. You know, a television camera reveals a lot of things about, about a person you can't hide in front of a television camera. But all, all that, that friendliness, that, that, that willingness to work together, that willingness to, to do the very best you can do, that willingness to make our community a better place, that came through. And to close out our month-long celebration, we salute WBIR's first black anchor, Miss Edie Ellis. All that and more today as we close out Black History Month with a look at African-American pioneers. Well, as we close out the month with a look at African-American firsts in our area, we begin in the world of radio. Knoxville's first African-American disc jockey was Albert A.C. Boy Wilson. He was born in Greenville in 1911. Wilson made his way to Knoxville and picked up work waiting tables at restaurants around the city. He began hosting R&B shows such as Sunset Serenade in 1949. He started out on WKGN before moving to WIVK. From 1955, to 1956. He would also appear on local television hosting Teen Tavern on WTVK Channel 26. He also operated the Pitchfork Drive-In, a popular food spot in Mechanicsville. Wilson passed away in 1959. Historians have been searching for records of AC Boy's radio shows, but unfortunately they seem to have been lost to time. And earlier this month, we introduced you to Pamela Anis, the owner and DJ of radio station Lit 97.1. But the first African-American owned radio station in Knoxville was WJBE, which stood for James Brown Enterprises. That's right, the godfather of soul was the owner of the first black radio station in the city. Brown purchased a previously defunct station for $75,000 in 1967, and he hit the airwaves with his brand new soul station in January 1968. Eddie Beacon was one of the DJs for WJBE. I was just a young guy in 68, you know, right out of uh, uh, Fountain City, and uh, I was excited to death. And uh, I actually got to meet him about five times in those uh, in the in the time I worked there. And um, he, he was such a, a gentleman, and he was concerned about the community, and he was concerned about the kids. And his main purpose was try to improve the community. James Brown owned WJBE until it was sold to Knoxville-based broadcast media in 1960, 1979. Excuse me. Well, the University of Tennessee was desegregated in 1961. Theodis Robinson Jr., Charles Blair, and Willie Mae Gillespie were the first undergrads to attend classes at UT. The first African American to graduate was Brenda Peel. In 2020, former WBIR reporter Yvonne Thomas sat down with Peel about her college experience. You can tell by this collection, Brenda Peel is a Tennessee fan. I applied was accepted, as they say, the rest is history. History in the making. In 1961, Brenda was one of several black students to enroll as an undergrad after integration. That's the thing about UT. When they decided that they would admit uh, African-American students, they did it without any fanfare, without standing at the doors. They did it in a very civilized way. But Brenda's college experience was unlike most of her peers. She was one of the only black faces at a predominantly white school during the civil rights movement. I knew when I enrolled basically what to expect, but I knew what I was there for. My goal was to complete my education and get the degree. And she did it. Three years later, Brenda became the first black student to receive an undergraduate degree from UT. I don't know if they knew that they had an African-American student who was graduated. That was nothing unusual attention on me. And that was fine with me. Mm -hmm. I just in line like everybody else. 
Her contributions in Knoxville have not gone unnoticed. Brenda was inducted into the UT African American Hall of Fame. In 2011, she was recognized during the university's 50th anniversary of African American achievement. But I always thought that there should be emphasis on the one who graduated, the one who went to the school and did what they were planned to do and finished the course. Brenda Peel paved the way for thousands to follow. Her perseverance shows what it means to be VFL. A vol for life. Brenda Peel passed away in 2022, but the legacy she leaves behind as UT's first black graduate will live on for generations to come. Welcome back. Down the road in Alcoa, the new mayor is making history. Digital storyteller William Winnett shares the story of the woman breaking barriers in Blunt County. There's no other place like Blount County. It's not perfect by any means, but it's the place I feel safe. My children, my grandchildren can feel safe. Tanya Martin was elected mayor of the city of Alcoa last year. Her rise to mayorship was historic, making her not only the first female mayor of Alcoa, but also the first African-American one. But the thing that really sticks with me more than anything when that happened was thinking about my mom and my dad and the fact that I wish they had been here to see this. But I, I am just believing that God allowed them to take a glimpse of this and that it was happening. By her side is Vice Mayor Tracy Cooper. And let me tell you something. Her name is Tracy, mine is Tanya. That's TNT, what does that come out? Dynamite. And that's what we intend to be. With two women holding such prominent positions, Martin hopes she can be an inspiration for the younger generations. I will not be the last woman to hold this position. I'm looking at our young girls and letting them see you too can have the same thing. In the past, women have been put in a place. Now we get to step outside of that place. When her time as mayor comes to an end, Martin hopes she is remembered as someone that was compassionate and fair. And I want to continue to be a voice not for black, not for white, Hispanic, but for everybody. Dean Martin was elected as a commissioner in the city of Alcoa, winning by only five votes. She stresses that every vote does indeed count. There's your proof. From slavery to the speedway, Cal Johnson left an undeniable mark on Knoxville as the city's first black millionaire. Former 10 News reporter Jim Matheny has more. Trot through this neighborhood in East Knoxville, and the houses hide the history of a time when real horsepower was off to the races. When you mention it, how it's an oval, then people say, oh, I see, and I, I get that many times. The man who owned the track that's now the Speedway Circle neighborhood was the ultimate underdog. Cal Johnson coming up from slavery to be one of the wealthiest black men in the state of Tennessee is just a fascinating story. Cal Johnson was born a slave of the McClung family in 1844. As a young boy, he worked on the farm and became an expert horseman, just like his dad. His father, Cupid Johnson, was a winning jockey himself. So horse racing was in Cal Johnson's DNA. After the Civil War, Johnson bought horses, not for racing, but to pull wagons when he found work digging through death. He got a federal contract to dig up the bodies of soldiers who'd been killed in the war, and he used that money to open several saloons in downtown Knoxville. Cal Johnson opened the Poplar Log Saloon at the corner of Vine and Gay Street. He served blacks and whites, was known as a polite and respectable man. Well, it was Cal Johnson's nature to be a gentleman. Johnson's Tavern eventually changed its name to the Lone Tree Saloon because it had the only tree left on Gay Street. Money was growing on trees for Johnson with his saloons and real estate. He could afford to buy the animals he adored as a child. He owned one of the finest strings of racehorses in the South. He owned the mare Lynette, the horse George Condit, one in the Chicago World's Fair. 
Then Johnson bought the finest tracks for them to race in East Tennessee. He purchased what became Speedway Circle from the East Tennessee Fair Association. The tracks held horse races and even the first airplane flight in Knoxville. Johnson was a man so respected, voters elected him to city council. But his string of success in business was saddled after a tough turn of the century. In 1907, Tennessee banned gambling on horse races and also outlawed liquor. Much of his income was destroyed by those two state laws. Thank goodness he had his real estate to fall back on. Johnson continued making money on real estate and buying and selling fine racehorses. And he donated vast amounts of the money he made to charity. So much so, the city named a public park in his honor. When Johnson reached the finish line of life, he had no children. And most of his estate, worth half a million dollars, eventually went to the church. So he was very civic-minded, gave his money to worthy causes. The city park, the recreation center, and one of the buildings in downtown Knoxville still bears his name. And this remarkable story of a slave who found the fast track to big business left a lasting impression on the shape of a neighborhood at Speedway Circle. That's the telling story for me from Cal Johnson, that I was a slave, but yet look at what I achieved. Look at what I contributed to my community. Now in 2019, Brianna Mason Brody became the first African-American woman to win the Miss Tennessee pageant in its 84 year history. And today she's using her platform to spread awareness for autism. 10 News anchor Robin Wilhoyt has more. Give it up for your new 2019 Miss Tennessee, everybody. I was Miss Knoxville twice. I was Miss Tennessee Waltz, and then I was Miss Green County. Pageant queen and VFL Brianna Brody was the first black woman to win the title of Miss Tennessee. I remember my first year that I competed. It had all the winners of the past competitions, and I didn't see anyone that looked like me. And from that moment on, I wanted to fill that space for someone else um, who would come after me. It took a while, but on her fourth attempt, Brody accomplished her goal. Something that I take very seriously because I'm able to be um, a good representation for uh, little girls and boys that look like me. Inform, collaborate, celebrate. That is the motto of my platform, Advocates for Autism. In 2016, along with her husband and high school sweetheart, Terrell, Brianna started Advocates for Autism in honor of Terrell's sister, Bethany, who has autism. If she was ever to come to UT, a big school like UT, should would she feel comfortable or accepted or included? Advocates for Autism now has chapters on college campuses statewide and helps those living with autism find resources and creates a community of acceptance. We have people on the spectrum that serve as officers, whether it be vice president, president of the organization, secretary, whatever. Right, and they're getting acclimated with responsibility outside of school. Like Brianna, Bethany is creating a legacy of her own. Years down the road, she'll probably realize her impact that she's left because even now, uh, as we speak, we have a scholarship and it's named after her. It's been a really amazing journey uh, being able to not only honor, you know, TJ's family and his sister, but also um, in press upon our mission of including, informing, collaborating, and celebrating those with autism all across the state. For more information on Advocates for Autism, you can visit the website on your screen and also follow them on social media. Finally today, we close out our Black History Month coverage with a salute to a pioneer at our very own station. John Becker has more on the incomparable Miss Edie Ellis. Channel 10 and you, together we can take on the world. Edie was Edie, black, white, yellow. It, it, it didn't matter to me, and I don't think it mattered to the audience. Former WBIR anchor Edie Ellis began her career at WBIR in 1982. Hi, I'm Edie Ellis. Welcome to the World's Fair and to Welcome World. Of course, she came here to work on the World's Fair programming. And uh, that ended on October 31st, 1982. Well, sometime around there, uh, Jim Hart, the manager, came to me and said, how would you like for Edie to be your co-anchor? And the more I thought about it, the more I worked with the idea, the more I became acquainted with Edie. 
it was a wonderful idea. I can tell you're the strong, silent type. Mm -hmm. Obviously a will of iron. Edie immediately left an impact on a young Robin Wilhoyt. When I came to WBIR, I already knew about Edie Ellis. I was struck by her warmth and her graciousness. And also what really hit me is in times of crisis, when there were big stories, she was able to deliver these stories with just a sense of calm. As WBIR's first black anchor, Edie proved to be a role model and always took time out for those who looked up to her. I remember uh, being with her when she would have young black uh, children or adults and they would s ask her for advice and um, consultation and she was always very encouraging. Put on my foes and home my friends. Her influence didn't stop in the community. It spread to those she worked with as well. Edie inspired me. She inspired everyone. It was always the hope that you could be like Edie Ellis. And she just raised the bar to a point where we all try to at least reach that. Straight from the heart is more than just a slogan. It's something Edie embodied. Edie Ellis was, is straight from the heart. Everything she did was for the benefit of the viewer, the benefit of East Tennessee. And that to me is what straight from the heart is all about. You know, a television camera reveals a lot of things about, about a person you can't hide in front of a television camera. But all, all that, that friendliness, that, that, that willingness to work together, that willingness to, to do the very best you can do, that willingness to make our community a better place, that came through. We're out of time for our update report. Thanks for joining us. Have a good weekend and a good evening. Good evening. <laughs> And that does it for us tonight. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey throughout this Black History Month. It's been truly a pleasure. And shout out to our digital storyteller, William Monette, for putting all of this together.